It's going to be my pleasure to close out Demux for this year. I'm always inspired by this uh, this uh, event. I, I come here and I sit in the audience, and then I realize there's people way smarter than me doing cool things, and it gets me excited. And I have this glow of optimism about all the stuff I want to do, and I think it's shared by many here. And it's going to be crushed by our corporate overlords on Monday. <laughs> So we should all bask in, in the warmth of optimism that's going to last throughout the weekend. So my talk today is three roads to Jerusalem. You're probably wondering, what does a city that hosts three religions have to do with low latency streaming? So it's a story I want to tell, and all great biblical stories begin with reading something from an old scroll. So that's where I'm going to start my story for you. So in the beginning, God created adaptive segmented streaming. It was good, and she was pleased with her work. And then on the seventh day, she was kicking back, which is a Sunday, watching Sunday night football when she realized she had a problem. She had forgotten she had created something 30 years earlier called broadcast television, and that her new solution was not as fast as the old solution of broadcast TV. There was unhappiness across the land. So God decided to solve the problem by using an approach she had used before, 2019 years before. In fact, she put up a star in the sky, and she sent out a call to all the wisest men in the land to bring forth gifts, not gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, but gifts of low latency, buffer stability, and scalability. And the wise men heard her, and they, they, they came. So coming from the east, <laughs> flying the flag for Dash, Thomas Stockhammer. Now, I'm picking on individuals here because, really, this is the collective work of hundreds of people. But Thomas is a person who deserves recognition for all the work he does, both in ed authoring Dash in the first place, being the editor, and also driving the Dash industry for him. So back in 2016, the Dash Industry Forum wrote a Dash profile for ATSC3 for their uh, Dash, and they care about low latency. So that was the first introduction of low latency there. And then in 2019 this year, the complete CR for low latency with Dash has come out matched by DVB Dash as well in, in their most recent version. So the Dash crowd has been looking at low latency. Now in 2017 at DMUX, you might have heard a talk from John Bartos riding the JW camel and flying a banner for trying to open source a version of, of HLS called LHLS, which had a similar approach uh, to Dash. And in uh, 2018 at FOMS, I remember, were the, was the first uh, sort of working preview of that. Now, this class of solution for low latency represents work done by several other companies, of which Twitch and, and Periscope, uh, Twitter Periscope are two of you. So that's Cyrus Hall there riding the Twitch camel, and representing many companies who use a similar approach. Now, we had a late entrant uh, this year in June at WWDC. That was Roger Pantos with low latency HLS. Now, Roger's cool. It doesn't get any cooler than Roger when your name is on the spec. Well, Bill May's there too, but he left Apple, so it doesn't count. So when you're that cool and mythical in the streaming world, you don't, you don't walk to these type of events. You basically fly. <laughs> So Roger flew in. So here we have our, our responses to the call for low latency. And uh, it should be noticed that uh, Bardos has now actually jumped off the uh, JW camel and is riding the Twitch camel. I want my slides to be technically correct. <laughs> and I also know that the VideoJ channel is, is a cruel place for commentary. So right now they are commenting that I don't know that camel knees don't bend forward. Um, <laughs> In fact, I know this, but after three hours of trying to animate camels at one o'clock in the morning, this is good enough. <laughs> okay. Right, so here are our three formats, or to continue my analogy, here are our three religions about how to achieve low latency. And when you step back and look at them, they match many of the characteristics of religions that you find today. They have their patriarchs, they have their churches, and they have a belief system that says the other format's bad or evil. And many times this belief is driven more by faith than it is by fact. 
So I've documented the links here. These are not to go over. This is just in case you want to experiment or, or play with some of this. Apple's put out a lot of reference software, same for Dash and same on the LHLS side. So I want to look at what's common between these standards because, in fact, there is a tremendous amount that is common. They all require content to be chunk encoded. They support end-to-end -end latencies in the 2 to 10 second range. They're backwards compatible with older players, meaning if your player doesn't understand the low latency version, it should play a higher latency version and not break playback. They're all cacheable by CDNs. They all support DRM. They support ad insertion. I say support meaning theoretically, you can do it practically. It is a challenge. They support multiple codec types. They allow ABR playback and they all focus on HTTP delivery. So there, there's a lot that is, in fact, common. What we tend to focus on, however, are the differences. And there are many here, and I want to point them out. And in, in this diagram, the green indicates yes or no in response to the statement. It doesn't necessarily indicate this is a good property or a bad property. So using chunk encoded transfer, this is the tr chunk encoded transfer, HTTP 1.1, separate from chunk encoding not supported by LLHLS. And uh, by the way, I, I forgot to mention the, the naming here. We, we call these things, I've seen people refer to them as many different uh, versions. I'm trying to standardize LLHLS is what Apple call it, so I think we should call it that. LHLS uh, is the open source, non-Apple supported version, and then dash low latency or dash, dash LL is what I'm hoping we continue to call the dash one. Going back. Do they describe the internal segment structure? Apple does. The other two formats do not. The segment is opaque. You don't know where intermediate keyframes might lie within it. They require a playlist refresh with every single chunk. Not segment, but chunk. Apple does. Objects always delivered at line speed. In the Apple solution, yes. In the other two solutions, no. They're encoder delimited because they are chunk transferred. Require separate servers or sorry, not require, allow separate servers for playlists and segments. In Apple LLHLS, because of the requirement to do the push, your same server has to be delivering the playlist response as well as the subsequent part. Require H2 for the last mile, that is a requirement on the LLHLS side. Require a smart origin to modify the playlists, another requirement on the LLHS slide. If you remember, Apple came from a, a background where it was a simple HTTP server, and in fact, that is, all these formats here can run off a simple HTTP server and haven't to date yet required origin intelligence. And deterministic startup, I might have to explain what that is later on, but this is supported on the Apple spec, not so much on the other two specs. So there are a number of differences here. I only have 20 minutes today, but I want to go in this talk and, and look at three of these. So the first one, obviously, is chunk transfer encoding. So this is how the segments communicate it. I don't think too many of the video engineers, I, I, this is probably redundant information, but if your degree's in finance, uh, thanks for coming to DMUXT, and this slide's for you. <laughs> so with chunk transfer encoding, I make a request for a big segment. In this case, it's four seconds long. It's comprised of four pieces, but they are sent at the same rate that they're encoded. The difference with non... Uh, chunk transfer but still chunked encoded content, I would replicate that same transfer by independently, independently requesting each part. And notice the parts are delivered much faster. They're delivered at my line speed, my throughput speed between my client and my origin. They're not limited at, by the output rate of the encoder. So two different philosophies for how to get content from an origin to a client. So. Both LHLS and dash low latency use chunk transfer to release the segment from the origin through the CDN into the client. And this is a changed set of transfers. The encoder will post to an NJS point on the CDN. The CDN perpetuates that, that chunk transfer through its mid-tier out to its edge server, and the edge server continues the chunk transfer all the way to the client. So that you can be, the, the source buffer on the player can be decoding the start of the segment while the encoder is still making it and pushing it into the CDN. So the benefit is you only require one request per segment. So you make one request every six seconds, and you will then get a push of data for six seconds. 
It always delivers the data in the correct order, which is the order it's encoded, and as fast as it is produced. And it allows small chunks to be used. So our chunks are our, our smaller unit under the segment. And in some of the examples I'll, I'll show later, we use chunks of one frame. So it's a chunk size of, of 33 milliseconds or so. A lot smaller than, than if you start using parts and have to request them independently. The problem with chunk transfer, and I believe the core reason Apple decided not to use it, was that the data speed is encoder limited versus line speed, as I mentioned. This makes it difficult to estimate your actual throughput. If you're playing a stream that's four megabits per second and you time the segment delivery from when you receive it to when you started it, divide that by the, the size, you will find out that your apparent throughput is always equal to your encoded bitrate. So your play will never switch up or never switch down. It'll just stay where it is. And this is a problem. Now, I was excited. There was a new paper came out this year. I've been promoting it at many conferences. It promised a, a solution to this problem by basically examining the fact that in the real world, there are, in fact, little micro gaps between these chunks. And if you can look at the gap between the chunks that is received in the client um, versus judging them all to be equal, then if there's no gaps between them, they're line speed limited. But as gaps start to appear, it's an indication that it's encoder delimited. So you can discard those samples and only average over the line speed limited ones. Paper came out, they built a good model. It was an information done in Dash.js, Bitmoving did it, but Bitmoving are not contributing it back because they're not happy with the open source agreement. So. I'm a little sad about that. I would have thought that we should, as an industry, attempt to try to solve this problem with chunked encoding. And I worry a little bit, since legal has already reared its head here, are we going to have IP problems with this solution for chunk transfer? I really hope not. Um, but I don't know quite the state we are today. And certainly, Dash yes, we're going to go ahead and try to implement this independently. And the IP will be what it will be. We'll deal with that challenge when we get to it. So I do find the use of non-use of chunk transfer of a curious trade-off. If you think about it, a LLHLS player, its job is to request chunks the moment they are produced, and it must request them in the order they're encoded um, and feed them into its source buffer. And chunk transfer encoding gives you this for free. So the player makes one request for the segments, get the chunks, and they're in the correct order. So the downside remains the throughput estimation. Now, you still, in the Apple approach, you have to estimate your throughput based on a part. And as Marina in indicated this morning, their parts are 320 milliseconds in size. That's a small object to estimate your throughput over. And it gives you fluctuating uh, readings when you do it. So you still have a problem with throughput estimation, not as great as with chunk transfer, but you have one. So you get a marginal increase in throughput estimation complexity, but you're incurring a huge cost in part generation complexity and a very high frequency of playlist updates. So it's a trade-off that's been made, but I still think it's a curious one. It might have been a better path to try to figure out how could we estimate throughput in the face of chunk transfer. Maybe the server can help us. Certainly with Quick, we have a good knowledge in the, with BBR, for example, of what the estimated throughput is. We could be telling the client what its throughput is. So there are a number of ways we might have worked around this problem. Difference number two, internal segment description. So the nice thing about the Apple Playlist uh, structure is that it describes all the IDRs or the, the access points within a segment. So I've put up a sample segment here. This is just an example of my making. It's four seconds long. It's got 500 millisecond chunks in it, but 1,000 millisecond parts. So the Apple part is comprised of two CMAF chunks, and it's four seconds long. So the, there's two benefits with the player knowing what the internal structure of the segment looks like. The first is that you can switch at boundaries, internal boundaries, instead of segment boundaries. So if I should have continued my example from my picture because they don't match, actually. But in the, to match the picture, it, the segment's four seconds long. I can actually switch every two seconds in and out of this. So if my buffer's draining and I'm low latency, I want a quick switch opportunity. But if I didn't know that that internal number five, for example, uh, IDR existed, I would have to wait till the end of the segment and probably drain my buffer and end up rebuffering. So it's very useful for switching. It also improves startup logic. But there's a challenge here. We actually want longer segments. And this is some data I just pulled out of an Akamai research project, which I think is very interesting. 
Its fresh data was collected September 2019, so last month. It was globally collected. If you look at some of the, some of the sample requests, there are 660 million. So there's decent averaging going on. But what it's showing you is the, our estimated throughput based on the object size being sent. So this is H1 traffic. We're not into H2, we're not into Lucas's H3 here. This is real world, mostly done with H1, where TCP windowing says that I need time to ramp up. And you can see it very clearly here. If I look at an object 10 to 20 kilobytes in size, the median throughput just under two megabits per second. But the same object at say uh, two megabytes is 13 megabits per second. Same server, same client. So it really helps to have bigger segments. So I took that same table and put it in a chart. It's a little easier to see here. And you can see that there's some, some uh, clear inflection points. So let's translate this into streaming terms. So if I take a two second segment at 1.4 megabits per second, it's gonna sit here on the chart. If I increase that segment duration to six seconds, it's going to sit further to the right. And the delta, obviously, is our difference. And these lines are plotting percentiles. So the red line is the median, then I'm going up to 75th percentile, 90th percentile. But you can see for the upper end, the upper half of my cohort, I'm getting a 50 to 40% gain just by having a larger segment. So it's quite useful in the streaming world to have larger segments, but again, it lowers my switch interval. So it's a trade-off. So that's why it's useful to be able to describe internal structure. So I want to be able to request a larger segment to get the throughput gain, but have the opportunity to switch at some increment smaller than that if I run into trouble. I mentioned it was used, parts are also useful at startups. So here we have a LLHLS playlist on the left-hand side and a, um, the same playlist without the parts, which would be conventional HLS. So it's interesting that your, your, it's your starting buffer that determines the starting position in this, in this player. So if I tell the player you must start with one second of buffer, it could start with this lower, this first independent frame because if you sum up the part durations, which are 333 milliseconds, you've got 1.3 seconds of buffer. So I can start, I have to start at an independent part, I can start there and immediately start playback. If I tell the same player you need two seconds of buffer to start, for stability reasons, it could choose the prior independent part and read forward from there. That would give it 2.1 seconds of buffer. Now, if we don't have the part descriptions, our, our choice would simply be start 2.7 seconds behind live or 6.7. So it's a monotonic multiple of your uh, segment duration. So parts are really useful for fast starts with low latency. You can always start quickly by starting further behind live. The challenge is to start quickly with low latency. And the more definition you have in the, in the internal segment structure, the better your ability to do this. You might at the same time question, how does LHLS player start? So here's a LHLS playlist. It's describing a prefetch segment, meaning this is a segment for which the encoder has produced the first byte, but not the last. But you don't know where between those two extremes you're sitting. So the player is going to request this, which is two, it's, it's somewhere between zero and two seconds of data. So if it's lucky and it wants one second to start and it's in the second half of that, uh, from one second to two seconds, it can start instantly. But if it's unlucky and it requests that it's just after it's been made, it's going to have to wait one second of wall clock time to get more data to build its buffer so it can start. Um, and it's deterministic. And if you really want a fast start, you can start further behind and play forward. If you needed more than two seconds, you would have to go and load the prior uh, segment. And then there's other schemes for loading, loading behind live to start quickly and then seeking forward uh, before you actually start playback. So both uh, Dash and LHLS have an issue at startup in order to be deterministic. Dash, it's a little easier because you know with a precise, more precise timing model where, in theory, your uh, playhead is with respect to the last keyframe. Now, difference number three is request rates. Um, and this is an undeniable one. So I want to take a, a case study which is actually driven off the LLHLS uh, draft spec, which shows a six-second segment with 333 millisecond uh, parts, so th three per second. So if I was playing this in dash low latency, I would have one request for audio and one request for video, assuming it's demuxed, every six seconds. And the data flow 
would look pretty much like, like what I'm showing here. It's a chunked, chunk transfer of a six second object. And I end up with 20 requests per minute. That's my client request rate and my edge server request rate. I care about edge server request rate because I work for CDN. Now, LHLS is similar. It's using the exact same media segments as the dash is, but it's adding in a playlist request. It has to have a media playlist update to discover what the name is of the new segment for it to pull. So its request rate is 40 requests per minute, double what the dash is. The data volume is, is very similar. However, the LLHLS has to pull four items uh, three times a second. It has to pull a media, a media playlist for the audio, a media playlist for the video. It has to then pull the part, the audio part and the video part. It ends up looking like this. And PowerPoint's unable to keep up because it's 12, 12 requests per second there. It ends up being 720 requests per minute. So maybe that gives you some idea, some idea of the increase in the request rate. Now, to be fair, if H2Push is working, from the client side, half of these requests should be fulfilled by the local H2 cache. Okay, so it's effectively 360 requests per minute crossing from the client uh, down to the, the edge server. But the edge server is going to see the full 720 requests per minute. And every request on a CDN has a cost. You may think it's tiny and it doesn't matter, it's just one request, but we have 60 million requests per second on our network, and they start adding up quickly. So there is a cost difference between 20 or 40 requests per minute and 720 requests per minute, and that's something we're going to have to work through as we look at deploying these solutions. What we'll probably see actually is larger parts being deployed as a, as a rational response to this request rate. But the downside of larger parts is higher latency. You can't get the lower latency uh, without the small parts. Difference number four is H2 push. So a lot of people are confused by the H2 push uh, proposed in the draft LLHLS spec. It's not that complicated. The player makes a playlist request and it adds a parameter saying, hey, push me stuff. The CDN reflects this down at the origin. The origin sees the HLS push um, it'll return the playlist and it embeds a preload link identifying the last part that's in the playlist because this is the part that the player is going to turn around and request. So the CDN will send the playlist to the client on an H2 response. Meanwhile, it, it's, it has to go back to origin, fetch this part. The part will come back to the edge and then it can push it in the H2 response. And the key difference here, and I think the part that's not valid, or the, it's not fully appreciated. The time you save is the round trip time between the client and the edge server. Why? Because that's where the H2 push is happening. It's not happening from the CDN to the origin, which is going back with an H1 request. Another important factor is the same server, in order to, same server has to deliver the, both the playlists and the media segments in order to push them. It has to control that connection. And if you think about advertising solutions today, those two are decoupled. You have your, your server-side ad provider is providing your manifest, manipulating it, as we saw with Hotstar, and your separate CDN server is delivering the content. So there's a problem here. Let's, let's look at, um, first of all, I'll show you that H2 push actually works, and then show you what the problem is. So I did some testing with DAZN. We had a nice talk leading off this morning. Um, here's the player that I wrote playing in San Francisco without push from a server that's located in Dublin. You can see the average part transfer time was 592 milliseconds, and the parts are 320 milliseconds long. So I just fell further and further behind live, couldn't play it at all. He has the exact same client, same connection, same edge server, but this time the edge server is pushing. And this lowered the part uh, transfer average time down to 252 milliseconds, which was lower than the part duration, and so I could sustain playback. It's not super low. I think it's trending to five seconds here, but my buffer is relatively healthy at, at 2.5, so I could have inched forward uh, in latency. So push works. Now, let's look at the numbers here, because I drew a diagram that showed that cloud neatly sitting between the origin and the client. But my client to my edge server is 26 milliseconds. My edge server to my origin, 160 milliseconds. So to scale it, I really need to move that cloud over closer to my client. And now I see the problem that the edge server has to make 
a whole round trip without the benefit of any push in order to retrieve the content. So it is true that if we could chain the push from the origin and not only from the edge server, we could have in this particular case with this ratio a five-fold reduction in the time. In other words, a much larger benefit of edge to push. And this is a structural problem with only pushing from the edge, and I think we're going to have to address this as part of large-scale delivery as well. So there's some significant changes that come with LLHLS, origin intelligence, because of mutable paylists, a large increase in the request rate, um, the fact that your same server must deliver the media segments as well as the audio segments, and H2 push. Now, these are all solvable problems, and we will solve them, but I'm highlighting them as, as ones that have been addressed today. But I'm interested in a common workflow. I'm interested in a Jerusalem, which is where the three solutions come together and coexist. Because low latency content distributors may well decide to send LLHLS to Apple devices, because it's always best to send a native protocol uh, to Apple, and in fact, the App Store may require it. But at the same time, they don't want the egress overhead to dual stack a Dash or LHLS to non-Apple devices. So can we design a workflow that has a single set of AV files that would be emitted from the encoder, has still preserves the origin pool model, has a single set of cacheable objects at the edge, and can simultaneously deliver all three solutions? So I think it's possible. And here's how it might work. So there's my hypothetical segment that I walked you through. So let's say we have a service requirement. I want the three protocols. I want a four-second CMAP segment. It's got a two-second GOP. It's got 500 millisecond chunks for the dash. And it's got 1,000 millisecond parts uh, for LHLS. So here's how it might work. When I decide to start encoding, I can immediately publish my dash, play, uh, my master MPD. And in it, I put the availability time offset which tells the client what the chunk duration is so it can correctly time its responses. Now notice the encoder is doing at the top, it's doing a chunked transfer. So this is where it differs, differs from the standard Apple workflow, but we're gonna deliver something to the client that it thinks is absolutely compliant LLHLS. So at this point, we've delivered one chunk. It's the keyframe chunk. I can now publish my master um, playlist for my LHLS and also publish my first prefetch segment on my media. So the output continues. So I'm monitoring my output, so I, that post is happening up to the CDN. After two chunks have gone, which is my chosen part duration, I can now publish my master playlist for my LL, LLHLS and do a media playlist update. And it's gonna describe that first part as a byte range into my larger segment. So the Apple spec, if you read, has a byte range addressability option, and this is where I think the interrupt can lie. It's also an independent part, so it describes it as independent. And I can come along here, and as we progress, you can see that basically I'm going to hit my next part. This part will become independent as well. I can roll on over to the right. At this point, I've finished my segment, so I can describe my full segment and start describing the first part of the next segment. Roll along a little bit further, and I'm, I'll be able to publish an update on my LHLS. So the same packager here putting out a single video is, is publishing these updates to the section. And I won't bore you with too slow a progress, but we can basically uh, continue out to the side. And that cycle repeats every, every four seconds. So that's what it might look like on the origin packager side. Um, now let's look at what it looks like on the CDN client. So imagine we're at the CDN edge now. We've got this chunk transferred segment that's flowing into our edge. So my Dash client is basically making its one get request, and it's going to retrieve that segment at pretty much the same, same rate that the encoder was producing it. And this cycle will just repeat um, for the two segments that I'm, I'm showing here. My LLHLS client is doing exactly the same thing, pulling the same object. So there's a very nice... Uh, a cooperation between the Dash and the LHLS client here. They pull the same object. The LHLS one is slightly behind the Dash by one chunk, uh, only because it has to read a media playlist first in order to know what the, the name is of that object, whereas the Dash client doesn't. And what happens with LLHLS? So I'll just let it get to the start of the next cycle. What the LLHLS client does, remember we published the media playlist update with the byte range. 
It only knows about the byte range after that object has flowed through to the edge. So it's making re get requests to the edge server, which the edge server can fulfill because it has all the bytes. So this satisfies the Apple requirement that the byte range is delivered at line speed and not at encoder speed. So this workflow uh, should actually work. Now, any proof of concept in um, the video world can be built with three things. Big Buck Bunny uh, combined with FFmpeg, Node.js, and an MSE player. So at Akamai, we actually have a live feed that we've put out driven by FFmpeg. We contributed the code. This just sits there, and it spits out these uh, chunk transferred chunk encoded segments and a dash and an LHLS manifest. So that gets me part of the weight there. But I need a, la a low latency HLS manifest as well. And I spoke to some origin providers. They couldn't get this done in time for DMUX. So I wrote my own in uh, Node. So what it does, it actually pulls the L LHLS playlist. It downloads this, the two second segment. As a box parser, it figures out where the chunks are, finds the byte ranges, it reorganizes these into larger parts because the LLHLS can't deal with 33 millisecond parts, so I, I put them into 500 millisecond uh, parts, and then it builds and returns a LLHLS playlist that points back at the actual media that's being delivered by the CDN. So this is, this, this is a proxy, essentially, on the manifest side. I'm not saying you would use this in production. The actual packager would do this, I, ideally but it works well enough here. And then I built my own LLHLS player because I don't know how to code uh, Apple players, um, but I do like JavaScript in the browser. So this let me test everything. Uh, so here it is working. Uh, I can start it. So on the right-hand side is the log file of the node service. You'll see it'll, it'll do a whole bunch of requests right at the start to catch up, but then after that it goes into a steady state where it's just passing a segment, pulling out the four parts, advertising them. And over here is the player playing. You see that the red line is the buffer. It's the familiar sawtooth. I'm giving it a one second part, it's draining. Giving it a one second part, it's draining. It'll hit a little bit of instability. But it's running reasonably well and it's stable. And this player is super simple. It's 500 lines of JavaScript. It's hard coded to just play this stream. So don't complain to me that um, it doesn't play your stream if you try it. Um, it's not meant to. But it's very useful for testing. So in theory, this can work, but <clears throat> I haven't really proved my goal of, of delivering all of them together. Um, here is the actual playlist that it produces. So you'll notice that it's got an independent part. It's identifying the four parts per segment. There are absolute references for the URLs, not relative ones, because I'm pointing back at media that's being delivered elsewhere. So here we have all of them together. So on the bottom left is that same player I just showed you playing LLHLS. On the top left is dash.js playing the, the dash version. Top right is hls.js playing the lhls version. And then for good measure, I put QuickTime Player just playing my actual lhls playlist just to prove that it's backwards compatible because my version of QuickTime doesn't understand low latency. So it's just playing about three seconds behind the other ones. Uh, but this is what we're going for. The key point here is if I show you from the browsers the network stack. We notice the same segments are being requested by every single player. The one on the, on the furthest right is the LLHLS. It's doing 206s, partial object requests, because it's byte range addressing. And the rest are, are full, uh, full object requests. But other than that, we've achieved our goal of having a common object at the edge. So to production, not so fast. <laughs> So what wasn't I showing you? I wasn't showing you a number of things. Um, and it's easy. It's very easy to get like, super excited with demos. Um, there's no current way on the server side. To, sorry, this keeps trying to disappear down my shirt. There's no current way on the server side to signal an HTTP range, push range in the pre-link header. So Roger's actually opened up this issue. You can go and contribute to it. This has not been resolved. So today, there's no way for the origin to say, hey, I want, I, using the, the link header to indicate that the edge server must push a range. Secondly, many CDNs, including Akamai, and I think all the CDNs right now, and they can correct me if, if I'm wrong, will not deliver a range request out of an object whose content, full content length that isn't known at the edge. 
Now, if you go and look at the RFC, it does allow you to do a response for an unknown content length. So this is part of the RFC, but it doesn't seem to be implemented. So I've checked at Akamai, and I hope to get this implemented, but this is something that certainly has to be fixed, not only uh, my CDN, but all the CDNs in order to make this work. And then lastly, we've done a bunch of testing with how H2 push cache works with partial objects. And it, 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 it clearly doesn't work. You, make a, you can push a partial object with a 206 response code into the H2 cache, but when the client asks for it, the cache ignores that and just goes to origin every single time. So there's, the way the cache has been implemented to date seems to require the, the full object to be present before it will serve it. So there's work to be done, and this is, affects MSE-based players. It obviously doesn't affect uh, native implementation. But these, these issues have to be addressed. Again, they're solvable problems. We can work together to solve them. So some conclusions for you. Number one, a common basis of a CMAF container holding chunk-encoded content is the foundation for interoperable low-latency playback. Uh, number two, I think if we use byte range addressing for parts, we can make a, a LLHLS compliant spec and deliver all three formats simultaneously, subject to fixing the issues I just described in the prior slide. And then lastly, and, and tying it back to my, my comments about religion and, and how we view formats, we, we can coexist. It would be nice if there was less dogmatism in the streaming industry and more tolerance of alternate ideas and formats and a stronger focus on interoperability, because that's what's really going to benefit all of us at the end of the day. And that, my friends, is the end. And now for something completely different. Thank you.